Let's talk about the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA if you prefer. FOIA, simply put, allows the people of the Commonwealth access to all public records and access to meetings where public business has been conducted. Seems simple enough, but as a member of a Board of Visitors, there are a few things we should review. First, let's discuss meetings. Seems like a simple concept, right? You've no doubt attended countless meetings in your professional career. But as an appointed member of a Board of Visitors for a public college or university, the definition of a public meeting may be different than what you're familiar with. You are now a public servant and need to understand exactly what constitutes a public meeting. Here's how it works. Any gathering of three or more board members can be a meeting. It can be face-to-face, -face, over the phone, or by means of video like Skype. And here's what really trips people up who are not used to being public servants. It's not about the location of a meeting, it's only about the content of the discussion. FOIA applies when any assemblage of three or more board members meet and discuss board business, which is by definition, public business. Perhaps the best way to go about this is to look at a few examples of what doesn't constitute a meeting. Here we have a gathering of three or more board members. So three board members run into each other in their local park and strike up a conversation. During this conversation, no one in the party discusses any public business related to their mutual board, nor was their encounter called or prearranged with the intention of discussing any business. So the three chat, and when they're finished, they go their separate ways. Now, does this constitute a meeting simply because the three individuals are board members? No, of course not, but you'd be surprised. Now on to another example. Let's say that one of these board members is appearing at a public forum, in this case a debate, and the purpose of their appearance is simply to inform the electorate and not to discuss or transact public business. Does this constitute a meeting? Again, no, even if the other two board members are present to hear the presentation. For a meeting to be legal, it must be properly noticed. In other words, scheduled and announced in advance. Minutes must be taken and preserved, and absent a statutory exception, the public must be invited to all your meetings. Okay, so now that we understand the basics, let's look at another example. This time an example that is considered a public meeting. Here we have a dinner party where three board members are in attendance. Throughout the course of the evening, the three members find themselves in conversation. Oh, hi, Bill. Terrence, funny seeing you again. Yes, quite. <laughs> what a great party. <clears throat> Anyways, as soon as any discussion or transaction regarding any public business is mentioned, this lovely, casual conversation amongst friends is now officially a meeting, and by default, the public has the right to be present at this meeting and to know about the content of this conversation. Due to the fact that this meeting was not previously noticed to the public, it is an illegal meeting, and the college or university those board members represent could face serious consequences. It's easy to see how a simple face-to-face -face conversation can quickly turn into an unlawful meeting. But what about technology? In this day and age, many of our communications are done over computers, mobile devices, and through other tech-based means such as video chatting, text messages, and more. Let's start with e-meetings. E-meetings are allowed for boards of visitors under heightened procedural and reporting requirements. For example, a quorum must be physically assembled in one location, and remote meeting locations must be open to the public. Now keep that in mind the next time you plan to participate while lounging at home in your PJs. What about email? We all use email on a regular basis. But can email constitute as a meeting? Yep. In fact, if three or more board members communicate simultaneously through email, this can be considered an illegal meeting. How often have you seen an interesting article and passed it on to colleagues? Pretty innocent, right? Now let's say the subject of that article is tuition rates at colleges and universities, and you send it to your fellow board members. If one of those board members comments on the article as it pertains to the upcoming meeting in which you'll be setting tuition rates and hits reply all, guess what? You're having an illegal meeting. There is a solution to this particular dilemma. Send such communications through staff. They can collate comments and disseminate them without running afoul of FOIA. Oh, and don't hit reply all. 
In your capacity as a board member for a public college or university, think of Reply All like a, a poisonous snake you don't want to mess with. Seriously, don't do it. <laughs> You'll thank me later. Regardless of whether you use your home or office computer, text message, or other forms of social media, it is the content of the record, not the equipment used, which matters. It is possible to have a closed meeting, but just like any meeting, there are a few things you need to know. Closed meetings are allowed only as specifically authorized by FOIA or other law and requires a motion stating the purpose, the subject, and code site. If a closed meeting is authorized, the content of that meeting must be limited only to subject matter specified in the motion. So don't go talking business as usual after the planned topic is covered. So are we clear on meetings? Yeah, I think so. Let's take a look at records now. What exactly is a public record? All writings and recordings that consist of letters, words, numbers, or their equivalent. So any information that can be accessed at a later date. A record can exist in the form of handwriting, typewriting, printing, photostatting, photography, magnetic impulse, optical or magneto-optical form, mechanical or electronic recording, as well as many other forms of data compilation. When in doubt, it's a record. Any information pertaining to public business on any of these mediums, no matter how it's stored, and regardless of physical form or characteristics, is considered a public record when prepared or owned by or in the possession of a public body or its officers, employees, or agents. Simply put, when any public business is documented in any way, shape, or form and is in the possession of a public body, it is officially a public record. Again, let me repeat, when in doubt, it's a public record. And all public records are open to the public unless a specific exemption in law allows the record to be withheld. So what does this all mean? As an appointed member of a board of visitors at a public college or university, you are a public servant. And as part of a public body, it's your responsibility to discuss public business in a public forum, and in doing so, reporting and documenting any discussion or transaction of public business. There are, however, several exceptions. You may contact another member one-on-one -on -one to discuss business or ascertain their positions by phone, letter, or email, but this cannot be used in lieu of a meeting or to authorize any action that requires board approval. As mentioned before, if you go through a staff member to conduct a poll, you're safe. Might be a better way to go. Also, if you choose to use email to contact other members one-on-one, -on -one, remember, you are creating a public record. Where voting is concerned, no secret or written ballots are ever allowed, ever, no exceptions. And that covers the basics to understanding FOIA and how it can affect you as a member of a board of visitors of a public institution of higher education. If you would like additional information regarding FOIA, there are a couple of resources. The Virginia Freedom of Information Advisory Council has a website with a wealth of valuable information. For specific help with FOIA issues, please contact the legal counsel at the college or university for which you serve. Each institution has an attorney assigned to it by the Office of the Attorney General.